One of the most commonly received answers when I ask business owners, the most rewarding aspect of becoming an entrepreneur is the sense of freedom, the ability to work from anywhere in the world, make their own decisions, not conform to somebody else's rules, decide how much vacation they get, decide where they get to work from. As long as they have internet, they are working. Today's guest is a digital nomad, owner of Maeve and Shay. Welcome to the Slipper Revolution. And I'm excited to share with you how she has created a life that she is able to live from anywhere in the world. Ready, friends? Let's dive in. What's up, savages? And welcome back to the Business Savage Podcast. I am your host and business coach, Cassandra Britton. I started my first of now four businesses at the age of 19 and have since scaled to six and seven figures. And I am here to spark that hunger inside of business owners and reignite their flame to take their businesses to the next level. Savages, we have a beautiful guest interview today that I have had the pleasure of being a guest panelist with at the International Women's Empowerment Conference. I think that was back in March. Uh, We connected via the event and I have been loving what she's been putting out there ever since. So I'm welcoming her to the show today. Victoria Marshman is a passionate and driven serial entrepreneur, marketer, community leader, and dance educator. She has operated and scaled two six-figure companies since 2015 and has helped raise over $200,000 for local Canadian charities through charitable events. Victoria is passionate about empowering and supporting young female leaders to pursue their dreams and mentor dozens of up-and-coming entrepreneurs. Recently, Victoria has co-founded Maeve and Shay, a direct-to-consumer brand focusing on organizing economic slippers for the fashion conscious women. The brand will be launching on Kickstarter in late June of 2022. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Victoria to the show. Welcome. Thank you. Great intro. Love what you got, what you're doing. This is awesome to be here. Super excited to have you. Okay. So let's kick things off. I'm super excited to talk about this product line. And uh, with the title for everyone that's tuning in here, this is going to be a juicy one about all of you that are interested in starting your own product line. Uh, I have my own product line. It was my second business. And uh, there's a lot. There is a lot that goes into creating a successful launch when you're launching a product. So I'm very excited to dive into this conversation. But before we do so... Let's give everybody a little bit of a Coles Notes version of Victoria. What is your backstory? What got you into entrepreneurship? Tell us all of the good stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, I I guess it's good to start from the beginning. So I'll give you I'll give you the whole story. Um, so I grew up in Toronto area. Um, from an early age, I would say about five six years old. My parents noticed something really unique about me. I just could not stop moving, like loved to move. So my kid, my parents put me in dance classes and that was when I really found my first passion, my first love dance. Um, I don't know about anyone out there, but dance, as you get more into it, it you become like an athlete. And I got to a level where um, I was dancing competitively And it was the thing I was the most passionate about, obsessed with. And I really do believe that's where my entrepreneurial grit and resilience comes from, is just being able to find this passion for something I love so much at such a young age. Um, Also, on the flip side of going into dance is it's very expensive, just like other sports out there, figure skating and all of these sports. It costs a lot of money to be involved in these kinds of activities. And I would say around the age 13, 14, I came from a very modest background. My parents kind of looked at me and they're like, we can't really afford for you to continue to do your dance classes anymore. And at this stage, I was like, I'm going to be a professional dancer. This is my career path. Like, this is what I'm going to do. So when I look back at my journey, it was that moment at, I think, yeah, I was 14 that I had to make a decision. Do I give up on my dreams? Cause you know, my parents financially couldn't contribute to my dance lessons anymore, or do I find a way to make it happen? Um, so I started a cleaning business at 14 years old, knocked on doors, Vicky, the cleaning lady. That was my first business, I guess. And, you know, put in the elbow grease after my dance classes to pay for my dance lessons. Um, I was also fortunate to have an incredible dance um, studio owner who knew my financial situation and just helped make it work. Um, And once I was old enough, I got a part-time job. But I do really believe that, you know, (laughs) 
that was the start of me understanding what it takes to build anything, not giving up, finding a way. There's there's always a way to get to that end goal. And um, although I didn't become a professional dancer for long, um, just because of some injuries that I sustained in my late teens, those lessons that I learned along the way to get me there um, really shaped me who I am. So that's my early life. And then I went to the University of Toronto and joined the dance team there, which was great. And that's actually where I met my business partner, who I've built two working on number three businesses. And we've been business partners for um, over 12 years now. So we actually met on the dance team. We took over the dance team. We became co-captains. And it just, you know, the, those things that you just can't explain where you look at people and you're like, our souls are meant to do incredible things together in this life. That's what happened for her and I. And I'm not saying it's been all rainbows and butterflies. Gosh, it's like a marriage. Like we've gone through the biggest ups and downs in building businesses together um, and have had some of the most hard, the most difficult conversations ever. But we really have a strong foundation and friendship, which is how we've been able to do what we do. And it was during our university days that we really found a passion and love for bringing the community together through events, which ended up leading to us launching an event planning and production company um, in our mid-20s together. So we both had that united passion and love for dance and the arts. So we were doing a lot in the fashion space and charity events, a lot of runway shows. Um, and it led to us getting to this point with launching our own business. I don't know if you guys found this, but this was back in 2015. Things are a bit different now. But one of the biggest things you do to build a business, meet new clients is networking. It's like one of the biggest things you can do is expanding your network. Um, and we found back in 2015, the events that were out there to meet other business owners we're so dry and so transactional and so awkward. We're like, we can do better. We can create more unique events. Um, so that's what led to us launching our incredible brand, City Moguls, um, which is a platform for entrepreneurs to connect, get motivated and inspired. And we were hosting events every year to bring entrepreneurs together in a very unique way. We actually put together a fashion show that featured entrepreneurs on the runway for charity. So we had people like Michelle Romano from Dragon's Den, um, Alan Lau from Wattpad, Joanna Griffiths from NYX walk in our show. It's called the Mogul Awards. So we've had some incredible people um, involved in city moguls over the years. So fast forward to March, 2020. I know that's like a pivotal moment for so many people, but for us, the carpet was really swept from under not underneath us. We were running two in-person event companies, City Moguls and uh, Stratus Events, which was our event planning firm, and everything got canceled. And it was, you know, like so many of us, a defining moment in our lives. And rather than just sitting and waiting for <laughs> the pandemic to happen, to pass, we 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 made two big choices. Number one, and we decided to let go of our event planning company. I guess you can look at that as like not a failure, but something we were like, do we want to hold on to this business, this overhead through a pandemic when we don't know when in-person events are going to be back? So we let that business go. We managed to pivot a good part of City Moguls online by building an online membership community. Um, but we had a little bit of time because we had been running two businesses. And while we were home during the pandemic, one of the biggest things we realized was we didn't really have anything to put on our feet. Like, I know that sounds funny, but we were walking around all day at home in our socks. And, you know, we would wear some slippers, but for the most part, they were like pretty ugly or not ergonomically designed. So wearing them all day, like I actually, my hips and knees and feet were actually hurting by the end of the day. So it got us thinking, you know, where is that ergonomic fashion forward slipper? And we bought dozens and dozens of slippers and none of them really met our all of our needs, especially, I know this might be TMI, but like slippers get so stinky like if you wear them all day you like take one whiff you're like oof I'm not wearing those for a while so we were like these are problems like 
Slippers are not ergonomic. They're not fashionable. Like you wouldn't wear them in front of friends or family at home and they stink. So that's where I am now in my journey is we built Maven Shea. We are launching a slipper company. We are building this dream slipper that just does not exist for all of the women at home working so hard and raising families. You know, that's one of the biggest things, right, is working from home is here to stay. Like, although we're getting out of the pandemic, um, people are spending a lot more time at home now than ever. Wow. So that is quite, that is that is quite the story. I definitely did not know the uh, the lengths of your event planning business. So that is really cool to hear. And the fact that you started when you were fourteen years old. So you've got me beat. I thought nineteen was pretty good, but fourteen has fourteen has me beat. <laughs> That's amazing, though. Quite the journey. And you can. I love too that you talked about your grit coming from dance because one of the things that I talk a lot about is my grit coming from hockey and from competitive sports. And I just, I love that you said that because it just really double clicks on. And not that I'm here talking about put, putting your kids in sport, but I am a big believer in putting your kids in some kind of program when they're growing up because it teaches you so much more than just those skills. Right. So I really love that story. So we are going to focus on, uh, you've got a lot of stuff going on on the go. So we're going to focus on your up and coming business, Maven Shea, which I've had to repronounce 17 times. <laughs> I've literally spelt it differently on my notes so I can make sure I pronounce it properly. It's C-H-E-Z, but it's pronounced Shea. So I am curious, where did this name come from? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, the Shea, so for those that speak French, uh, C-H-E-Z means home in French. So okay. I'll, I'll get to it. So um, we wanted to pick a name, you know, it's so hard picking names for a brand, but we wanted to pick something that we wouldn't get sick of. So it's actually um, a play on my, myself and my business partner's middle names, which is actually our grandmother's name. So it's a beautiful story because it really pays homage to our ancestors and the strong women in our lives. So Maeve is actually short for Mavis, which was my my dad's mom, my grandmother, um, a beautiful woman. So that's short for Maeve. And then Shay is short for Shayna, which was um, Danny's grandmother. And it's funny, you know, there's so many ways to look at different meanings, but Maeve, we, as we, as we've built the brand has become short for Maven, which is a word that people often use for like an expert or a connoisseur. Uh, so like you're calling your community, what do you call your community? Here? Business yeah. savage? Savages. Sa- savages. Savages. We're calling our community Maven. So it's, okay. it's sticking, it's working. That's how the brand has been going. And then uh, Shay means home. So when you directly translate Maven Shea, it's expert of the home. So we're starting with slippers, but we'll probably go into other products for home. Okay. So (laughs) a side plug here, but when I talk to my clients about branding, so I'm a brand agent and what I do is I help people grow a brand. That is what I'm talking about. There's so much thought put into that name. There was so much thought put into all the different levels of how you're going to tie it together. And I can already imagine one of the things we're going to talk about, but I can already imagine the story of how you're bringing this brand to life and how it's going to have so many elements of what you just touched on in there. And that's what really creates a strong brand. So I really love this. I love how this is unfolding. Okay. So let's talk about uh, what it takes where you start, you know, when you decide you guys came up with this idea, you're sitting at home, you're realizing you want these fashion forward, ergonomic friendly, beautiful slippers. So many women are working from home. Um, what's the next step? You know, you guys hadn't done this yet. You hadn't been in a product based business before. So where did you guys start? So I think the hardest thing about when we were launching is it was the pandemic. So not an excuse, but definitely more challenging because most of the factories, suppliers, manufacturers were closed. But that's where we started. We started looking into places that made slippers. And initially we were like, we want them made in Canada. You know, we got to be a Canadian um, made organization because we're Canadian founders. But it was virtually impossible to find a factory that actually develops Um, footwear in Canada that was affordable. Most were like, you know, at its minimum cost, like $100 a pair, which is just not realistic. So that meant we had to reach out to factories uh, globally. So Brazil, China, India, Portugal, and our initial 
our initial step was just reaching out to factories to see if they would work with us. I think one of the biggest challenges with launching a product that doesn't exist. So I'm sure you guys have learned on Cassandra's podcast, the difference between creating a product from scratch and white labeling a product. So white labeling a product is when there's something that already exists and you put your brand on it. Whereas we wanted to create something that we know doesn't exist. We did the R&D. It does not exist. So I think that's also a big step is before you even start looking for the product, do a full audit and research of what's already out there. Who are your competitors? What have they created? Um, what are what are their key differentiators? And um, seeing how you're going to be the unique player and what your unique features are going to be. So we started reaching out to factories. And honestly, it was just door after door. Also, just very hard to get in touch with these factories. A lot of them are stuck in the 90s where you can only call or you, they don't even really have emails or proper websites. So six months in, we really didn't make any traction to finding somebody who could help us make this slipper. We knew what we wanted. So we we got some great advice to reach out to some to um, brokers who specialize in working with factories. Um, so we ended up finding somebody who is a shoe technician who has been our savior. He's been in the industry for 20 years and has worked with some of the biggest footwear brands in the industry. And he holds a lot of the connections with factories and developing um, footwear from scratch. So for us, that was our missing piece is we actually needed to find somebody that was an expert in footwear to bring us those connections to help bring our vision to life. We couldn't do it alone. Yikes. Yeah. It's a lot of work. So how long has been the, the process been? I know you're, you're about to launch on a program called Kickstarter, which we're going to talk about in a second. Cause I wasn't sure what that was. Mm -hmm. Um, how long has the process been from the time that you started thinking about it, started really looking into it to it actually becoming something tangible that people can purchase? So it's been over two years. Wow. Like this idea was a pandemic idea, April, May, 2020. Um, we started working and moving through it. Of course, things have ramped up a lot more in the last six months. But it's taken a lot of time, a lot of an investment. Obviously, I was talking about this footwear technician. There's a lot of costs that we've had to put up front from our personal savings to get this off the ground. But we we really believe in it. And we just want women to be so comfortable and feeling good at home that that's our you know driving motivator to get this off the ground. Yeah. I love that you just touched on that because it's something that I wanted to ask you with my product line. You know, I had about $15,000 saved when I decided that I wanted to go into to my product line and it wasn't enough. Right. And when you decide that you want to get into all these different elements and have a good website and um, all of the research and development costs, like it ends up being a lot. Um, so I love that you just touched on the fact that, you know, you have to dip into your own savings because I think that's something that some entrepreneurs don't expect and we all need to be reminded of is you have to invest to make money, whether it be in a coach who's going to teach you the way or whether it be having some savings or getting a loan or something because you you know that the power of what the future holds is going to be worth it. But I think a lot of entrepreneurs are scared to do that, right? They're scared to put out the money before they even really know for sure if it's going to work or if it's going to come back. Um, so what was that process like for you guys? And I don't need financial numbers, but like, you know, were, were you scared putting your own money in and being like, I don't know if this is going to work? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, you know, the other two businesses we had launched, we bootstrapped ourselves. It was very like low cost. I think when you're service-based entrepreneurs, things can be a little more manageable, you know, because you can get a client and then, you know, slowly build things as money's coming in with, with product companies, as you touched on, you have to put so much you know, resources, time and money before you can even launch it. So it just does not work that way. And I don't know if you found this, Cassandra, but for us, we we applied for loans. We went to the banks. We went through a, a couple like Canadian organizations and we got declined for most of them because we were pre-revenue. They wanted most places, traditional financial institutions, if you're applying under your business, want to see some kind of traction that you have sales, that you've proven the concept a little 
little bit. So because we haven't even launched yet, most of them are like, sounds great. Come back once you have sales. So our only choice was to invest our own personal savings and, you know, line of credits. You know, I just, I'm a big believer in life. If you're not going to bet on yourself, then what the what the F is the point, right? Like we're here to obviously do big things, each and every one of us, things beyond ourselves as individuals. So, you know, a little, if a little money is going to help you get closer to making that a reality, you know, if, like you said, it's going to come back eventually. And I think because we've done two businesses before, we have a little more trust and faith in ourselves that we'll be able to do it again. But the cost is definitely higher. Like I'm talking, we're already six figures into six figures with how much we spent to get this business off the ground. Well, I guess I've got a lot of slippers to buy. <laughs> I, I want to, I just want to touch on this again for a second here, because when you say it's been two years, that process of two years, I, 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 that number to me, like, I really want to talk about this because another thing that I know some, some people, and I don't like the word fail, but they fail in entrepreneurship because they expect instant results. They want that instant gratification. They think, Oh, I'm a business owner. I should just be rich now, you know, all that sort of stuff. And they don't really realize what goes behind the scenes. So from the time that you guys decided this was going to be a great business and now it's been two years and you haven't formally launched it yet, right? So money hasn't come back yet. I'm sure there's been times and it's probably really beneficial having a business partner, but I'm sure that there's been times where you've lost motivation. You've probably wanted to just quit. You've probably been like, let's just cut our losses now. You know, all those sorts of things. How did you get through that? What what types of things do you do? Do you say to yourself... How do you stay motivated and get through that when it's been two years before you've actually launched? Yeah, you know, (laughs) sometimes it's like every other day. So I, you know, I want to, yes, you're so right, Cassandra, that there are, it is, you have to be in it for the long haul and there's ebbs and flows. And, you know, the minute things are like at your highest high, like, oh, we achieved this milestone the next day, like, it sometimes the world can seem like it's like crumbling in front of you. Um, you know, I have to give kudos to my co-founder, Danny. She has been like unwaveringly motivated and inspired to get um this off the ground. Um, in our partnership, she's definitely like the visionary um type, whereas I'm more operations, brand building. Um, So we really complement each other well. But, you know, the first year I was very, you know, every day I was like, I don't know, is this the right thing? Very hesitant, but it was really our my belief in her and our relationship. And in the past, she has come up with ideas and they've always worked out. So a little bit of blind trust on my part in our partnership together that trust Danny, she has a good eye for this. She's, she's good at seeing the vision that that's not my strength. I step in more once like it's, it's a real thing and I can start building it. So she was definitely a big motivator for me. Um, But personally, you know, Cassandra, I know we connected on this a lot with, um, going away, I find that like, if I'm reaching a point where I'm just really lacking that motivation and inspiration, I need to change my environment. And I know for us North America, Americans, winters are really hard. So I find that even if I'm just, you know, in a nice climate, Mexico is my go-to spot, Sayalita. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's phenomenal. Um, I find that if I'm in nature and sticking to my morning routine of meditating and journaling and building that discipline, which like we've learned comes from being in sports and activities as a kid is I know what I need to do to fuel my body and myself to show up my best self for the rest of the day. So I try to do those things for me in the morning before I start anything else. And if I stay consistent with that morning routine, I find I'm staying consistent and motivated to get through the day. So I think that answers your question. A hundred percent. And you, you're a perfect segue into one of my other questions for you. Maybe you can just touch on for anyone who's thinking about going into business with someone. So I have three previous businesses. This fourth is with a business partner. And I have never at one point in my life thought, 
I wanted a business partner. I was always like, no, I am a control freak. I need to be able to have full control, make all of the decisions. I've never felt so much, um, what's the proper word? Like a sense of calm, sense of full fuck. Yes. Like knowing she is the perfect business partner for this business. And it's so nice being able to feel like that and not be like, Oh, like, are we on the same page? And am I going to have to pick up after her or any of that sort of stuff? So what is it like? You've done all of these businesses with Danny. Mm-hmm. What makes it work? And cause I know a lot of co-founders and business partners, it doesn't work. So what has been so successful for you guys? Yeah, I, you know, I'm going to be really honest with you guys because I think that a business partnership is even more complex and serious than a marriage. Like, I'm not married yet. (laughs) I have a long term partner, but, you know, um, I, I, I think because you're investing in a business together, there's money involved, there's a lot of complex layers. You really have to look at it as this thing you have to put a lot of work into. And I think for Danny and I, that's always been the big thing for us is we never let little things become big things. We're big with communicating with one another. One of the um, things that we've established that helps us like keep our friendship and our business partnership really, really strong is we watched, um, you might have heard of this organization, Y Combinator, but they had this really interesting series about working with, you know, a co-founder and processes you can establish to keep your relationship strong. So once a month, her and I, we have a meeting um, where we talk about the same things at that meeting. So the first thing we do is we clear emotional debt. So maybe there was like conversations or things that we did to annoy one another or, you know, you know, those little things that sometimes fester that bother you about people at that we, we, we like write things down throughout the month in this document, basically, and we call it our emotional debt and we get it off of our chest and we talk through it and we propose solutions for, um, you know, how we want to move forward from this and how we want to learn from it and strengthen our relationship together. So in that meeting, we talk about emotional debt. We talk about um, our goals. We check in on our responsibilities for the business and, okay, have things changed? Are you taking over something that I was doing before? Are you, are we both following through with everything we said we were going to do? So we, I think at the end of the day, it's that honesty It's that communication. It's respecting each other's boundaries. Uh, Danny has a nine month old as she had a baby last year. So, you know, I'm very conscientious and aware that she's met, she's juggling multiple babies right now. And sometimes Maven Shea is going to take a back seat to her beautiful daughter. So I've had to, you know, adapt and surrender. And our relationship has changed since she's become a mom. So, you know, at the end of the day, I love her so much and our relationship means more to me than anything. So I think at the end of the day, that's what's helped us get here. And it certainly has not been easy. I, like I said earlier in the podcast, I've had some of the most difficult conversations and experienced the most growth as a human from my relationship with Danny. Wow. That's really good advice for a lot of business owners going into business with a partner. I I love that you said it's just as complex as a marriage because I think a lot of people don't realize that. Um, And I love that you guys do that monthly reflection. I think that's super, super powerful practice for people too. Because you're right. It's all the little things, right? It's that little stuff that you don't say, but you'll probably tell somebody else. You're like, oh, I can't stand the way she did that. Or I'm, you know, this is annoying me, but you don't tell them. It's like, why? Right. If you have the right business partner who's open to that communication, then you should be able to talk about those things. So I love that. And I appreciate that. I think another thing I just want to touch on really quickly is you mentioned that you need your morning routine and your meditation and your journaling and your morning practice. And I just wanted to bring this in for all of our listeners here. In case you guys haven't noticed, there is a very common theme with the entrepreneurs 
in the, in the entrepreneurial space. And I don't only bring on spiritual entrepreneurs at all. It just happens to be something that we almost all do is meditate. We have a routine. We ground ourselves. We journal. We reflect on our thoughts. We're aware of what we're struggling with. We're aware of room for opportunity and for growth. Uh, and so I, I think that that's, you know, I, I didn't even know that you were into all of that or that you did any of that. And so it's, it's interesting to me that that is a common theme with entrepreneurs is we find that way to ground ourselves. Let's talk about Kickstarter. What the heck is Kickstarter? <laughs> that's that's a great question. Okay, so I I consider myself not an expert yet on the Kickstarter method. I will be once we've successfully done our Kickstarter campaign, but I'll explain it to all of you. Um, so Kickstarter is a type of crowdfunding. What is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding is a way for companies to raise money by collecting small and individual contributions from a large pool of supporters. So one of the biggest problems we talked about at the beginning of this podcast was it's very expensive to launch a product. So the power of crowdfunding is that you can use donation reward-based crowdfunding um, to get a good chunk of money to help you get your product off the ground. So how it works is right now, for the last six, we, we technically launched Maven Shea in November of 2021. We said, this is us. This is the product we're building. By the way, the slippers are called house flats. So we're trying to like think think of a new way of talking about shoes indoors. House flats, kind of like a common, it's like your indoor shoe slipper, I guess. Um, so we launched in November and the whole goal of launching then was to start building momentum and excitement that we're gonna be launching this product very, very soon. And how we build that momentum is by building a pre-sale list. So I'm sure, Cassandra, you guys have talked about the power of email marketing. And, you know, it's one of the best ways to it's the one thing that you actually own, because when you use social media tools and stuff, it's great. But the algorithms are always changing, blah, blah, blah. It's great. But email marketing, I do really believe is gold. So what we've been doing over the last six months is building a pre-sale list. People who are like, I love this product. I want to be one of the first to have it. Sign me up. So we the goal with the kickstarter plat, platform is that you're launching your product on kickstarter and people are pre-ordering the product on the kickstarter platform to get the product in like three to six months so what that helps us do is generate a lot of sales really quickly so you know our goal is to sell 500 pairs on the kickstarter platform and then in exchange, that's also going to give us enough money to be able to buy the first run of inventory of the slippers. You know, when you're buying products from a factory, you can't just be like, I need five, please. There's there's these things called minimum order quantities, MOQs. So our MOQs are pretty high for footwear. So we're using the power of Kickstarter not only to get a ton of new customers, but um, a ton of pre-orders because they're putting money down to get those slippers in the near future. And then we're also getting enough money to at least get that first run of inventory on Canadian soil to our customers. Wow. So is it it's, is this like blowing your mind? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I've never heard of this program and I think this is really cool. And I have a couple of questions for you around it um, because you know, as a brand agent, I want to talk to you a little bit about your brand and, and, you know, how you came to life with all of that sort of stuff. You've been giving me little snippets here, but one of the things that's so imp important and powerful is listening to your audience, right? And knowing what your audience wants, not just what you think that you want or what you and Danny like at home, but what does your audience actually want? So something and, and everyone that's listening, you know, for people to pre-order something, pay for something, a slipper, right? A house flat, a slipper, not an overly complex thing. You have to brand this and market this in such a way that they are willing to wait three to six months before they're even going to get this damn slipper. So let's talk a little bit about what that has been like for you. Like, What is the marketing behind this? What is the story that you've been telling? Have you been getting people interested and in on this pre-sale list 
for a product they're not even going to get for six months. (laughs) Yeah. It sounds crazy, right? But we have a lot of people on that list, so we must be doing something right. Um, So, I mean, it comes down to the basics, right? You know, Danny and I are just young female entrepreneurs working from home. And this, our idea came out of the pandemic. Like I talk, we've talked a lot about our story, our why, you know, we're so driven to give women products backed by science. Like we've put so much energy and effort. We've talked with podiatrists. I told you we have a foot technician on staff, like every little detail of this slipper is so technical because that's what we're passionate about. You know, we both, it's so funny. It's like a full circle with, with life. Like we were dancers. We were so um, obsessed with anatomy and moving our bodies and the technicality of becoming an athletic dancer. And we're applying that same knowledge to designing a slipper that's really good for a woman's foot and is meant to help them stand all day without, you know, having back pain. So things like a deep heel cup, arch support, an anti-slip rubber sole so you don't slip going up or down the stairs, um, a wide toe box so your foot can sit in its natural state and not be crunched. One of the things I talked about earlier was like, Slippers getting really stinky and gross fast. So we've actually sourced materials that are naturally moisture wicking. So the the sweat from your feet won't stay in the shoe. And my favorite part, which is the most exciting part and is our most unique feature, is the insole that's actually built in the slipper is machine washable. So you can take it out if it's feeling a little stinky or, you know, getting that like gross feeling, you throw it in the wash on a gentle cycle and put it back in your slipper and they feel fresh and new and clean. So not only is that, you know, helping the duration of your slipper, it's keeping, you know, cheap slippers out of our um, garbage and all of that. It's you're a, you're going to be able to replace that insole over time. So your slippers are lasting like a running shoe or, you know, a, a more high end shoe like they should be. I so, absolutely love this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think um, to answer your question, like how we've been able to build a presale list without, you know, not even having the final product in our hands and also people patiently waiting is we've really listened to what women want and need. So I don't think I touched on this yet, but we've we've done surveys over the past year and a half, I think upwards to of a thousand women and ask them like, what are you missing at home in your shoes? Like, what do you want? So, you know, as much as Danny and I are passionate about all of these features, you know, every time we talk to women, we're getting their feedback on these t- these features too and really listening to them. And this, this Kickstarter campaign is going to help us validate that, right? Like, are people actually going to put money down for these slippers once we launch? This is amazing. I absolutely <laughs> love this. I, I didn't even really know the full scope of what you did. And I'm just super, super glad that we're having this conversation. Um, because, you know, one of the things too... So many business owners are like, oh, it's been done before, right? Or there's so much competition. There's competition in every damn industry. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You can invent a nail polish. There's 7,000 other nail polishes out there. Like it doesn't matter, right? So, you know, you guys aren't reinventing the wheel here, as you said, but you are, you are two things. You found the pain. You found what was not working about something that currently exists that there's a need for. Women need slippers and there are things about it that is not working. And you have found a way to say, hey, I can fix that this slipper, this house flat, I can fix that for you. And then in addition to that, you've used what is the most powerful form of marketing and branding, which is storytelling. And you've combined that all into your own story with Danny's story and tying that all back into you guys being dancers and the passion and the why behind your brand, which really, really carries it forward to your stories connecting with other women and then being able to resonate with your brand. So congratulations. Sounds like you're, yeah, it sounds like you're really doing. Thank you. And it's honestly, I, 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 I told Cassandra this, but I am big on, you know, I think it is your duty as an entrepreneur to share the knowledge and pass it on and help other people get their dreams off the ground. So, you know, sounds corny, but I genuinely believe that each of us are here to create 
impact and do something incredible. And it's usually ourselves that are standing in our own way from doing it. So if you ever want, you know, some motivation or to pick my brain on something, I really am an open book and love to help other entrepreneurs. So uh, I'll share a link to book, a, you know, a call with me. I'm always down to help people really get their ideas off of the ground and step out of their own way. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. Really appreciate yeah. that. Uh, Before we go into our round of rapid fire, is there anything else that you would like to share about your brand or or key takeaway when it comes to launching a product line that you would like to share with our audience? Yeah. So, I mean, you guys have heard the whole story of how we've gotten here and we're not even there yet. I think one of the biggest things that I've learned through this process is just surrendering a bit to timelines. You know, as entrepreneurs, we're so hard on ourselves and we make all these like arbitrary, like we have to have this done by this date. And I think through the pandemic, we've realized like so much is out of our control, you know, so do what you can today to get a little bit closer, but also realize that it's going to take a lot longer than you think. So we've had to really swallow that and embrace that over the past two years. Did we think it was going to take two years to get to this point? Hell no. We were like, oh, it'll be a year till we launch. So, you know, that patience and that perseverance and their favorite word, that grit is so essential to getting products and businesses off the ground. I love it. Amazing. Well, if anyone is interested in launching their own product and they have further questions around that, um, my second business is an e-commerce product line, not quite the same level as what you've done. Um, And then obviously, Victoria has offered her calendar to have some conversations with you as well. So thank you for that. Let's dive into some rapid fire. I have about 10 questions for you. You're going to give me your gut response to all of these. Try not to think too long about any of it. It's whatever comes to your mind first. You ready? Let's do it. Okay. Biggest goal that you have in mind right now? Build a slipper empire. I love that you use the word empire. Describe yourself in one word. Gritty. Most challenging aspect about being an entrepreneur. Um, not getting paid for a long time. <laughs> Most rewarding aspect of being an entrepreneur. You said it earlier and I couldn't agree more. Freedom. Freedom. Favorite podcast that you're listening to right now? Ooh, big lover of Sahara Rose's podcast and Tara Brock. She's a big meditator. Um, me- yeah, meditation coach, I think. Cool. Uh, who inspires you the most? Ooh, sounds corny, but my mom, biggest advocate, supporter, always there for me. Love her. Something in your daily routine that you could never skip. Meditating, meditate, meditate, even if it's for five minutes. If you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? I would be working in a garden center and just being surrounded by plants all the time. Okay. My retirement goal. Cool. I like it. And when you're not working, where can we find you? What else are you doing? I'm traveling. I'm living in other places and always dancing wherever I am. Last question. Uh, Next place you're traveling to. Uh, We're actually booked for the West Coast, BC. So we'll be in BC and Washington State end of the summer. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I'm going to host a retreat out there soon. So that's, that's our next, yeah, that's our next spot. Awesome. Okay. So before we wrap things up for today, I'm going to put obviously all of the details uh, where you can get a hold of Victoria. You can check out Maven Shea and join her pre sale list. Uh, all the details are going to be in the show notes. We'll put your Instagram handles and all that sort of fun stuff. What is the last piece of advice that you were leaving entrepreneurs with today? I would want to encourage everybody to get through the messy parts. I think people don't realize that everything is always going to feel clunky and awkward and messy when you start. Like none of us have a clue what we're doing, guys. Like no one does. So push through the messy, uncomfortable moments and it will just make sense one day. I love that. I like your words, gritty and clunky. I'm going to start using those in my vocabulary. <laughs> yes. Take those. Thank- 
Thank you so, so much for taking the time to be here today. I really appreciate it. I know that this is going to be super valuable for these entrepreneurs, product-based businesses. Um, So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, Savages, that is all that we have for you guys for today. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Victoria Marshman and are inspired to create a business of freedom from anywhere in the world. Hit the link in the bio and please join her pre-sale list. All of her details are in the show notes. Be sure to give her a follow and check out all of the cool things that she is doing. I appreciate you. Go slay your day. And remember, a savage doesn't let anyone or anything stand in their way. They can get knocked down, but they will always get back up. Keep on fighting. Peace, guys.